So we have the rise of nationalism and a revolution in the arts. Now that doesn't quite make sense to us, uh, but we'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. So again, after talking about nationalism the other day, by using that, that poll that we talked about, you know, we have, again, the coming back of these political ideas, and these come in terms of building different nations. Now, last unit we talked about the French Revolution in terms of these ideas. But they're going to spread all throughout Europe. Remember these, right? Conservative. Usually coming from the very rich or wealthy property owners and nobility who wanted to protect monarchies around Europe. Now, a monarchy is ruled by what? It's a government ruled by who? One what? It's one ruler, but... It's specific. Who always rules a monarchy? King. king or a queen. Right? So we always have a king or a queen. But at this time period, with ideas that have sort of been thrust into the 19th century, into the 1800s, do we want kings and queens anymore? Generally. No, right? We do not want them anymore. This idea of conservative, remember, turning the clock back. We want to go back to way, the way it was. It might not have been perfect, but at least it worked, right? That's the idea of conservatism. Then we have, on the very opposite end of the spectrum, we have liberal. Usually made up of middle class people who want to elect their leaders. But it wasn't quite as liberal as we think of it today. They didn't think that everybody should vote. This would have included minorities could not vote, women could not vote, and only if you owned land could you vote. However, for the time period, that is sort of a big idea that people should elect their leaders. Of course, we would agree with that today. We elect um, our leaders today in this country. Um, so this doesn't seem all that big of an idea. But back then it was, it was a revolutionary idea. And then we have radical. This is the crazy, crazy talk of the day. And radical, they supported democracy for all. That means everybody got to vote. And it was a true democracy. Now, in this country, do we have a true democracy? In the United States of America, do we have a true democracy? Well, I guess we have to find out what a true democracy is. What is a democracy? I like the people word. Giram, what's a democracy? People have the power to? I heard it. Vote. So people vote. But in a true democracy, what do they vote on? Who they want to be elected. What else? Yes. So they vote for elections, and they vote for laws. Do we have a true blue <laughs> democracy? No. We do not. We have what's called a Republican democracy. It's a blend of two, or a Democratic Republic, however you want to put it together because we vote on people to make laws for us, right? We don't deal with everyday laws. Now, there are some laws that we do vote on, right? Um, 
remember back uh, around voting time, the citizens of the District of Columbia, they voted on a certain law. Thank you. What did the citizens of D.C. vote on back in November to do? It was a law that they voted on. Was that? It had something to do with what has been an illegal substance. Go ahead. So they, the citizens of D.C. voted that marijuana should be legalized. Question? Okay, so, so like I'm, and this is why it's a little bit different. So the, the citizens of the District of Columbia, so Washington, D.C., right up the road, in November, they voted to pass a law that would legalize and decriminalize marijuana in certain amounts. It had certain guidelines. Now, I think I do that. In D.C., yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying. So, in a, in a true democracy, they would have made the law and then voted on it. Here, we have representatives that we vote on to make the laws, and then in this particular case, they have people vote on it as well. However, most laws that we do have, we do not vote on. We vote on very uh, minimal a minimal amount of laws, but very important laws. Uh, usually, um, statute like the legalization of marijuana, like the uh, marriage equality laws, right, for the lesbian, gay, transsexual, bisexual community, right? We th those laws get voted on sometimes in certain states. Um, so, but we are not a true democracy, like. The radicals back in the 1800s wanted everybody to vote. Now, where does democracy, the idea for democracy, come from? What ancient civilization did it come from? Nah, no. The Greeks, yes, came from Greece. Greece had the idea that everybody should vote, everybody should uh, have uh, a choice. All right, moving onwards. So again, the, the return of these three ideas are, are in the scope of our uh, discussion. So here is a, a better definition that I can come up with of nationalism. And that is the belief that people's greatest loyalty should be to their country, not their king. So again, we're getting away from having that king. But your greatest loyalty should be to the people of your country. Now if I ask everybody in here something, the most, the most simple thing, what is your favorite color? I would get probably 18 different favorite colors, right? If we had a king of this classroom, besides me, and Mrs. Walls, uh, being the queen, uh, and we had to have a favorite color for the entire classroom, they would choose it. I'll grab one of the sheets off my carpet. They would choose it, right? And then everybody would have to wear that color. Would that be fair? No. But that's how it would be in the king. The king makes all the laws. The king enforces all the laws. We're getting away from that. Our greatest loyalty should be to the people. We all have different ideas. We all have different choices. Now, we can come together on certain things, yes. But we still should have a say in some of those things. Then we have this idea that's come back and forth, uh, and that's about the, the nation state. And that's a nation that has its own independent government. Uh, 
Now, what are we getting away from with this idea of a nation state? There's one word that we're trying to get away from. Napoleon had one of these. Who can remember what Napoleon did? He conquered land, right? And all that land was called what? When anybody conquers a large amount of land, uh, starts with an E, but not explore, not territory, something bigger. Uh, you're expanding your country's rule over more areas, but technically it's not your country, but you call it something different. There it is. It's an empire. So an empire... No. Empire would be my favorite kind of apple. No. Empire is this large entity, so a large uh, amount of land that is conquered by one person. And then they are called the emperor of that land. So France in the early 1800s had France as their country. But then Napoleon went out and fought all these wars all around the country, uh, all around Europe, and even had some territory in the United States. And that was called the French or the Napoleonic Empire. When he took them over, who was their leader? No, no, no. Napoleon was. Because he was the emperor. So no, I wasn't trying to make it too hard. Napoleon ruled over them all. So they had to change their government. But this idea of a nation state comes out of that. We don't want emperors leading large, large pieces of land anymore. We don't want that. We want each people to rule their own government. We want them to vote on it. We want them to have their own representatives. It's not fair for people to be ruled over somebody who has no idea what they do. But in 1815, after the death of Napoleon, or excuse me, after the capture of Napoleon, only France, England, and Spain could be called nation states. Everywhere else in the world, excuse me, in Europe, everywhere else in Europe was ruled by somebody that was not their own government. So we have large pieces of land in Russia, in uh, Prussia, in Italy, in all around Eastern and Southern Europe. We have places that are still ruled, not by their own people, but by somebody else that has taken them over. So here's a little chart to make it a little bit easier to understand. Things that bring people together are in this uh, circle, I suppose culture, a shared way of life, not only food but traditions. History, a common past, they, they understand common experiments. Now, when people came to the United States, or when people still come to the United States, say they don't speak the same language, where do they go? To a community where they feel comfortable. If we went over to Bucknell Heights, there is a distinct community aspect over there. What is the majority of people over in Bucknell Heights? Anybody live over there? We can think about it in terms of elementary schools. What kind of kids are at those elementary schools? Over at Bucknell, there's a large portion of Hispanics 
that live there. They speak Spanish as their main language. Most of them come from El Salvador, right? Mm, I would say majority of the Hispanic population comes from El Salvador, over there anyway. Um, if we went to over into uh, um, Fort Hunt, there's two distinct communities there. You have an African American community, and then you have a white or Caucasian community that goes there, right? Uh, bi bigger communities, right? With smaller ones in between, of course. If anybody ever been to Miami? Lots of Cubans, right? Okay, so we, you, there, there's distinct communities of Cubans and Mexicans. Now, different, have similar culture, but they're different because they have the same language, but they have different histories, right? So, so we sort of understand this idea of. Well, that makes sense because they share a border with Mexico, right? Um, so, so um, I, I'm trying to get back to what I was going to say. Oh, so we understand this idea of going to where you're comfortable. <clears throat> now, in those communities, what's that? Yes, in those communities, um, who do you think rules their local governments? People from different communities come in and, and take over them? Or is it, do they vote people of their own? They vote people of their own. And at least that's the theory, right? That's the whole idea of a nation state, right? You can think of it in, in a, a community aspect. All right, let's move on. So let's talk about one of these uh, nationalism ideas sort of coming together. Let's talk about Greece. We don't, we rarely talk about Greece uh, after World War, but let's give them a little shout out today. So again, <coughs> only three nation states, France, England, Spain, other places were ruled by other empires, including Greece. Greece was part of the Ottoman Empire, a large, very, very strong empire in the Middle East. But Greece, ever since they lost their independence, had wanted it back. They want to rule themselves. They don't want somebody else ruling them. So when they, they were trying to fight for their independence, Greece is very, very small in terms of the Ottoman Empire. But Britain, France, and Russia all come to their aid. They come to, on their side and help them fight for independence. And in 1830, Greece gains its independence. They believed so much in their country. Going back, they have similar language. They have similar ideas, similar histories, right? They're their own community. They want to rule themselves. want to rule themselves, so they fight for their independence. Their nationalism was so high and so strong that they were ready to fight for themselves. Let's talk about France very quick, very quickly. I think most of this is written down for you. In fact, it's all written down for you, so we'll go over really quickly. Remember, we talked about France gaining its independence. They kicked out their king. Right? We talked about that. What's that? Yes, king tried to come back. In 1848, so about mid-century, about 30 years after they kicked the king out, that 40 years, different groups of people came together with those dip, those ideas, the conservative, the radical, the liberal ideas, and they want different kinds of reform. France is going to go through another series of civil war, but they're going to elect a president. They come to a consensus that they shouldn't be very, very radical where they're going to vote on everything together. But at least 
elect somebody who should do it for them. So that in 1848, and what has remained since, is they elect the president of their country. Actually, ladies, uh, France was the first country to elect a woman president in the Western world. Mm -hmm. After electing the president, after calming down all those uh, people fighting with each other, France finally makes their country better. After about 60 years of fighting internally, like civil war, kind of like what we had, they finally begin to be on the men and prosper. All right, let's talk about Russia a little bit. We always forget about Russia, even though they're so damn big. Huge, right? It's hard to rule Russia. It's too damn big. But it's okay. Uh, some, some, some do it. Serfdom. What's that word? We'll get to it in a second. Still exists in Russia, but people want to change. People see the freedoms happening in other countries like France, England, and Spain, and they want to get freedom. This idea of serfdom, you know what it means, but it's different in Russia always. They always called it serfdom. It's a little bit different than what you think of it as. Who can tell me what a serf is? And I'm not talking about serf in USA. Go ahead. Nope. Serfs are not upper. They were sort of like peasants or slaves. Serfs are very, very poor. Uh, almost slaves. They're very, very close to slaves. And they couldn't get out of their social class. So, mostly the poor, mostly the serfs, but others want to see that change well, Russia did not go through the Industrial Revolution, that whole thing we've been talking about, going from the farm to the factory. And it showed that there needed to be some changes, because they were not making the money that they should be, as a huge, huge nation. There were some problems there. In 1861, their czar, which is sort of like their king, frees the serfs and makes at least that change a little bit better. However, and this is going to be a struggle for them for a long, long time, industrialism is only going to be in small parts of Russia for the next 90 or so years. They're going to, Russia is going to be in an internal struggle for a very, very long time. And it's going to sort of hit its climax in 1917. Who can tell me what happens in 1917 in Russia? They go to this very, very radical government structure. What is that government structure? No. No. Something else. Somebody say it. Say it louder. It's communism. That in 1917 they're going to overthrow the czar, which again is kind of like a king or a dictatorship, and they're going to become. It's okay. They're going to become communists. They're going to become communists. We'll get there uh, in a couple, uh, about a month or so. Let's switch gears. I'll go through this kind of quickly. I know uh, talking about art is not always the most exciting thing in the world. But we will talk about it. Because art is changing. With art, the ideas of the time are always shown. That's why we talk about art. Because... Who cares? We're t we talk about very, very few people in history. We don't talk about the everyday aspect of life. That's why we talk about art. The 16th, 17th, and 18th century bring many changes in art and literature. During that time period, 
They're focusing on these ideas of the enlightenment. Now, let's remember what the word enlightenment means. Who can tell me what this word enlightenment means? Their ideas. What kind of ideas? Their new ideas. What do those ideas say? Well, they're helpful in ways, yes? Okay, yes, they're going to cause revolutions. Why, though? What, what are the ideas of the Enlightenment? They're coming from the idea that we all had kings and queens, and what do they want? The Enlightenment ideas want more power for Darnell. Enlightenment wants more power for who? Give it a guess. What's that? The serfs? Uh, not quite. DJ? People. They want more power for the people. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the Enlightenment, big part of the SOL of the NIV. Right? The Enlightenment, just the idea is that people should be able to rule themselves. People should have more power. So that's what art focuses on. It's big ideas of the time. Art's going to focus on that. But during the 1800s, artists are going to focus less ideas on the Enlightenment and more on ideas of freedom, getting even more radical. The rights of the individual, not just the broad ideas of getting more power, but that individuals should have rights. Women should have rights. African Americans should have rights. The poor should have rights. Minorities should have rights. What's that? In time. In part. They will get them eventually. If we take the United States, for example, Technically, in 1865, middle of the 1800s, African Americans are freed from slavery. Now, you could argue that they don't quite get all their rights until later in the 20th century. Uh, that would be a fair argument. But at least the idea is there. Women don't get the right to vote until the 1900s in America. Many minorities are still persecuted today. Uh, in America for different things. However, the idea that they have the same rights is there. Question? No, Renaissance was way back in the 1500s. Yep. So again, why are we talking about art? What does it have to deal with? It deals with everyday people. Right? If we take music, which is a great example of art. We take rap music. What does a lot of rap music talk about? What? What'd you say? You say the Lord? It does. Some, some definitely do, right? DJ, what else? Huh? Okay, so, so, but in terms of what? What kinds of shooting? Game related. Okay, gang-related shootings. Now, why do rappers talk about gang-related shootings? Because that's their life, right? That's their everyday life. They don't give a crap about what's happening with the president or what's happening with... Uh, grab that shit out there. They don't care what's happening in the laws, right? They don't care what's happening over in uh, with ISIS. The, well, some of them do. I'm just saying. But those rappers that talk about gang violence, that's what they deal with every single day. Or used to, depending on the rapper, right? 
but they're talking about their everyday life. Now, uh, if, we, if I make a different example, a little bit more lighthearted, Taylor Swift. What does she sing about in almost all of her songs? Love and breaking up with her boyfriends all the freaking time, right? That's her everyday life. We love her music. It's so poppy and catchy and stuff like that. I'm, I'm just saying general Americans, right? But I'm saying like Americans love Taylor Swift. She's one of the most famous artists. Despite like your beliefs are, uh, she is one of the most popular uh, artists in the country, right? In the world. But she's singing about everyday life, yet she's famous, right? Um, but, so, that's why we talk about these things. But in the 1800s, in art, so we're talking about just canvases and, and paintings and sculptures and all that kind of stuff. The ideas of freedom in the individual. Um, I'm going to get you a chair. Next. And I, an aspect of that art is romanticism. And in romanticism, it, it, it deals with nature and the thoughts and feelings of the individual. Again, expressing the individual ideas and not necessarily what everybody else thinks. Thinkers and, uh, and, and writers turn away from this idea of reason, right? They get away from, say, politics and get into what they are feeling. It becomes very emotional, and that's why we sort of call it romanticism, right? Romantic, that's an emotion, right? Uh, to have something that's romantic, love. Oops. Got a couple more things on the back. We're talking about four different artists of the time. We've talked about them before. We need to talk about them again. We didn't, we didn't cover them quite right the first time. So let's talk about Johann Sebastian Bach. First there on the back. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is very quick, very quick. So he was a German composer during the Baroque period. Again, Baroque means this ornate type of music. I'm not going to go on. Famous works include the Brandenburg Concerto and Mass in B minor. Actually, you don't even have to write this down. Oops. Yeah, just write the first one. So just know that he is... Uh, sort of in this idea of the arts during the romantic period. Do not write the second bullet, just the first. Next. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Right? We just know him as Mozart. He writes and is one of the first classical musicians. Classical music is going to drive this nationalistic idea in many countries. What's that? Yeah, that, that's it. Monday is a holiday, yep, it's Martin Luther King Day. 
No, they can't take it. That's a national honor. Next, Miguel de Cervantes, one of the most famous and and sort of top writers of the time. I never heard of him. He wrote, well, in 1605, he wrote what is called the first Western novel called Don Quixote. Hey, I already said that. It is considered the first modern novel, at least in the West. There is uh, a Japanese artist wrote an earlier work uh, that has since been You do have to write all three of these things down. I'll leave it on there for, for a little bit. Don Quixote is a story about a poor nobleman. So, uh, somebody who is rich, who goes crazy after reading too many other books. The idea that the more that you know, the less you know if that makes sense. Um, the more you know, the less you actually know. Or you realize the, that how much you don't know. Don Quixote. One more. I don't, I'm not going to go yet. talked about two musicians, a writer, and now we'll talk about an artist, somebody, a painter. And that's Eugene Delacroix, a French painter during the Romantic period. Again, this idea of the individual showing emotion. Delacroix takes Shakespeare's work from the 1500s and for the first time we see a large scale illustration of that. Now, in Shakespeare's plays, let's take Romeo and Juliet for example, are there a lot of emotions in Romeo and Juliet? Yeah, a ton, right? And that sort of goes along with this idea of romanticism. Coming into its own as an emotional, an emotional thrust into the arts. And in 1830, Eugene Delacroix paints Liberty Leading the People. Again, this idea of liberty leading the people. So an, an idea, one idea is leading individuals to a, to a, a group. Yes. And it's going to be. 